Hey there, and welcome to Day Tripper Television. This is Ross Chevalier. And he's Brian Weiss. I'm a professional photographer, and uh, I've been shooting for a number of years. I own Day Tripper Photo, and I also work at Henry's Camera in Newmarket, so you can always get a hold of me in many places. Um, day Tripper Photo is a local service designed to take you on day trips and help you understand how to use your camera while actually doing it. Very hands-on. It's a lot of fun. I've been a photographer for over 37 years, and part of our goal here is to share some of the things that we've learned in our careers as photographers, but also from many of the photographers that we've worked with, and share that information with you to help you make better photos. That's right. Now, our approach for teaching you this, um, or for having this show, is basically to give you some insight and let you understand different things. Each episode that we shoot is going to be a different topic. We're going to get into a lot of very interesting things, some technical things, and some very easy to understand things. The approach is going to be one of sharing knowledge. We'll also use some pictures as illustrations. We're also going to go out into the field and meet with working professionals and share some of that experience with you via pre-filmed video. And we may in fact have guests in the studio from time to time. That's right. Now, where can we actually apply this stuff that we actually teach today? Well, I think the key thought is that anything that we share with you in an episode is something that you can take away right now and start applying in the photographs that you take. It doesn't have to be a big fancy assignment. It could be your family, your children at a hockey game. Take the things that we share with you as tips and apply them to your real life, the things that you want to make photographs of. That's right. These are things you can use any place, any time. And we're also going to teach you how to think before you take a picture or make a photograph. And that's actually something that we're going to talk about quite often. It's not taking a picture, it's making a photograph. And that's a big deal. Back in the early days of photography, people talked about taking pictures. And in fact, the very first commercial cameras, things like the Kodak Brownie, were really built for the concept of snapshots. But we're going to focus on the digital single lens reflex camera. In fact, that's going to be the major topic of this episode. And this is a tool that helps you truly make a photograph, not just take a picture. Nothing wrong with taking pictures, but what you really like to have are great photographs. Great photographs on your computer, great photographs in web galleries, and great photographs printed on your wall. Absolutely. Now, hopefully watching our show will give you the tools to understand the settings, the numbers, the values, and hopefully uh, you'll get a lot of uh, really nice functional things that you can use these tips with. So we're going to look at not just the technology, but we're going to look as well at some of the aspects and, and tools that you can use to make better photos. Up next on our show is our introduction to your camera. We're going to talk about the digital SLR. We're going to talk about the point and shoots and the differences between each of these types of cameras. Welcome back. Let's talk about single lens reflex cameras. This is not a new concept. In fact, if you look in photo albums from your family or television or old movies, the single lens reflex camera has existed for a very long time. The idea is pretty simple, and I've got an old SLR right here to help illustrate that. This camera is vintage about 1960. The idea behind it is very straightforward. The light comes through the lens, reflects off a series of mirrors, and comes out the eyepiece here on the back. So we would look through the eyepiece, compose our photograph, and take a shot. This was wonderful. It was brilliant. It allowed any person to go out and start to make really amazing photographs. There were some challenges, though. You had to know all this techno stuff. You had to be able to read a light meter. You had to be able to understand a shutter speed. And back then in ASA, what we refer to as ISO now, know what your apertures were and do all your manual focusing. And then when you went to take a shot, a shoot, try that again, <laughs> when you went to take a, sh uh, a shot, you recorded it on film. And film was expensive. And so folks were very careful about the number of images that they made. But in the world of digital, everything changed. Brian? Well, when we get into a digital SLR, you're talking about a very similar platform. You have the aperture and shutter speeds that you can control. You have all the manual settings you can manipulate. But instead of recording your image to film, 
Now we're setting it to a digital sensor, which is just inside the camera. Basically, when the mirror goes up and down, the shutter opens and closes, it exposes this digital sensor to light. Now this is the fundamental difference between a point-and-shoot camera, like what we have right here, or an SLR camera. Aside from size of these two devices, the chip, the sensor, is a lot different as well. And we have a graphic here that shows you the different sizes of your sensors. And if you look at the and computer screen... if you check screen, your screen, you'll see an example of what we mean. So if we can, there we go. On the very bottom of this chart, you notice that it says most point and shoot cameras, which is exactly the little guy that I showed you. It's a very, very small little surface. And as you start to go higher end with your camera, the sensor also gets much larger. Now, the camera I showed you, my Nikon D700, is the second from the top. It's called a full frame digital SLR. Full frame implies that the sensor on my camera is actually the same size as a 35 millimeter film negative. So back in the day, if you think about the negatives that you may have seen your family have, or that you might have yourself, or slides, we looked at something that was basically 36 millimeters by 24 millimeters. That's the sensor size in the digital SLR that Brian is talking about. We used to write everything to film, and it was expensive. Now we write everything to some type of digital memory card. And one of the greatest hallmarks of the digital signal lens reflex is that you can now literally record thousands of images and once you've bought the card there's no cost to doing so so your experimentation capability is much greater than it's ever been but why would we use a digital SLR over any one of the other cameras sensors got a big amount to do with it but it's not the only thing no you have a lot more creativity you can control your image by choosing what specific lens you want to use we have on my camera right here this is a 50 millimeter I call it a portrait lens. It's a very bright lens, and it's a great lens for taking pictures in very low light situations because it allows a lot of light through the lens. Where here, we have a 24 to 85 lens, which is a multifunctional lens. It's a good zoom. A zoom means a lens that goes from something to something else. You can zoom in and out. But it's also got a macro capability, which allows me to focus very closely and get very good detail shots of things. So. One thing that we see with the digital SLR, the ability to change lenses, change our viewpoint without having to change our physical position. Now remember, we're capturing that information onto the sensor. So let's talk a little bit more about the sensors and their physical sizes. And Brian's got some really interesting examples right here. This right here is a circuit board from inside my old little Sony point-and-shoot camera. And if you look at there, that is your actual sensor. It's a tiny, tiny little chip. Now, sorry, go ahead. It's, it's super small. Now, one of the things that we want to make sure we get across is that you hear a lot about megapixels, millions of pixels. It's not just about megapixels, it's also sensor. Why is that? Well, when you think about it, your pixels actually sit on the surface of the sensor. And if you have a tiny little sensor like this, and you have, in this case, 3.2 megapixels, that means you have 3.2 million dots on that tiny little surface. Well, this is a sensor here from a, a higher end point and shoot. It's a slightly larger sensor. And as you saw on that chart that I had up a moment ago, the size of the sensor is slightly larger, which means you can fit more pixels on that surface area. The problem with a lot of cameras today is they're fit, fitting millions and millions and millions of pixels on these sensors. The sensor's not getting larger, and yet they're going from 3.2 megapixels to upwards of 16 megapixels or even more these days. This is a question that we hear from our students on a pretty regular basis. Well, I just got or saw this advertisement for a lovely little pocket camera. It's beautiful, it's small, I can carry it everywhere, and it's 16 megapixels. But, you know, my buddy, my wife, my friend, they've got a Nikon D700 and it's 12 megapixels. Does that mean that my new camera at 16 is going to make a better image? Not at all. Basically, the more pixels you have, the denser your photo, not the better your photo. The quality of your photo is really down to your lens, um, the size of your sensor and the size of your pixels, and the processor of your camera, and of course your creative eye. That has more to do with the photo than anything. What, the camera doesn't make the picture? Go figure. Actually, it's you that makes a photograph, not your camera. So that when the people come into our stores at Henry's or whatever, and they start talking about how this camera took a better photograph than my camera, well, my first answer is, really, did your camera take a photo? That's interesting. 
this is a very common conception that it's all about the gear. Frankly, it's not about the gear. It's really about you as the photographer. So what we want to accomplish is look at how this tool, the digital single lens reflex, can help you make better pictures. Brian talked about some of the settings that are available to us, and I promise you, as we go through episodes on the program, you're going to learn everything that you ever wanted to know about some of these settings. But let's start simple. One of the big differences between this old style single lens reflex camera and a perfectly modern digital single lens reflex is automation. The ability to let the camera do a lot of the hard work that we used to have to do completely manually. That will include setting your ISO, the camera's sensitivity to light. It includes setting the lens opening, often known as the aperture. It includes setting the shutter speed, how quickly the shutter opens and closes in response to an image. It'll even help you focus. And as we'll talk about, there's nothing more important than good focus. The idea of the tool is that it will help you make better photos. But if you've ever had your camera go off and it's got a beautiful out of focus shot of your foot, it's not the camera that makes the photograph, it's you. So what we want to focus on is how I can leverage all the functionality that's built into this amazing product so you can make better photographs. Let it do the things that it's good at while you do the things that you want to do. One of the other things that we're going to find in the digital lens, single lens reflex camera is that we don't have to live in automatic. It's a great place to start, but we can in fact have all the same manual control that we had in this older fellow. You get to progress at the rate that suits you. Meaning, as you become more comfortable, you can focus on making the images that you want and let the camera do more or less of the technical work as you choose. Take it incrementally. You get to learn a little bit at a time and let all of your knowledge and your experience create your photograph the way you expect to see it. Now, one thing I do want to mention, you don't necessarily need an expensive digital SLR camera to get a good photograph. You can actually use a lot of smaller cameras, and a lot of smaller cameras even have manual controls. You can adjust your shutter speed and aperture just as much, well, maybe not just as much, but you can still adjust it to a certain degree on the small cameras. So just because you may not have a digital SLR doesn't mean you won't be able to take advantage of a lot of the teaching that we give you on the show. Absolutely true. But please bear in mind, we're going to focus on those digital single lens reflex because that's, in fact, the most popular area of growth in photography. It's not the number one source of images that we we'll find on the web. I'm afraid that's one of these little guys, the smartphone. Truly the point and shoot of today. What's the expression, Ross? The camera you have on you is the best camera you could have. Exactly. So what we hope you come away with is a rationale to make better photographs and maybe get this guy out of the camera bag or out of the closet and with you. So you're making more photographs and making better photographs. Because one of the things that we've both learned over the years, repetition is the mother of skill. Or as the grade one teachers used to tell us, practice makes perfect. Absolutely. I don't know about perfect, but it definitely will make you better. When we come back, we want to talk about some common terms that we're going to encounter. Mm -hmm. And we find on a very consistent basis that there's a lot of jargon in our industry, and sometimes that throws new photographers and even seasoned photographers off. <laughs> Welcome back to our show. Uh, what we're going to talk about right now are some common terms that uh, not everybody fully understands. Now, we're, we're not going to get too involved in different terminology because throughout the rest of the episodes, we're going to have a lot of different terms we can discuss. But for today, we're going to talk about two major things that a lot of people have a lot of confusion with, the term JPEG and RAW. So everybody talks about JPEG. You see it in all the advertisements. When you look at web photographs, there's always some denotation about, oh, it's this JPEG or that JPEG. What the heck is JPEG? Well, what it stands for and what it is are really two different things. It stands for Joint Photographic Experts Group. It's the name that a group of people, photographic, photographic experts, decided to call this level of compression. And that's what a JPEG image is. It's a, a digital image that's already being compressed and developed in camera. 
So developed in camera, that sounds like a pretty useful function. Don't have to send anything out to a lab. I see my image right away. That's a good thing. But Brian used another word, and that word is compression. And typically when we talk about compression, it means we're squishing something. And some things don't compress very well, and that means you've got to take parts away. Is that what happens in JPEG? That's exactly what happens. Your camera is basically going to take your original binary code, your zeros and ones, and it's going to take every third bit and throw it in the garbage. So it's making your overall photos smaller, but it's also getting rid of a lot of that necessary dynamic range and detail that you would have, which you would keep your image in RAW. So if you think about RAW, think about RAW as you might hear it in the kitchen context. RAW is like a RAW piece of meat, or a raw egg. It is everything that you need to make the image that you want. Nothing's been taken away. But now you get to apply the tools, your talent, the services you have, to help make the image the way you want it to. Just as you might have a way to make the perfect hamburger that's different from somebody else's perfect hamburger. Remember in the days of film, we were very concerned about the cost of film. And back in the early days of digital, these little guys were pretty freaking expensive. You've got some old sample cards here, I think, that you know we can take a look at. What's funny about memory is as it progresses, it gets a lot less expensive. This is an old media card called Smart Media. This was used in cameras about five to 10 years ago, five to seven years ago, I would say. This little card right here is a 64 megabyte card. It's a very small card in, in the grand scheme of things, but it was one of the largest cards of this kind. This particular card probably cost an upwards of $200 when it was built or when it was sold originally. When we think about today's digital single lens reflex, and we can use examples from the Nikon or the Canon family, we're looking at cameras where individual images are going to be between 16 and 22 megabytes, so that card would hold two pictures today. The card that I'm holding up is a 16 gigabyte card. And this is one of the newest, fastest cards available. And of course, there's always movements in technology. 16 gigabytes could hold potentially thousands of images. So unlike film, and unlike the early days of digital, the thought that we had to compress our files, make them smaller so we could take more, is really very impractical now. You can actually get very large cards at a very effective price to purchase that are going to last you for many years, and literally you can take thousands of images. So as one of the teachers I listen to, a professional photographer named Rick Salmon says, raw rules. Wherever you can, shoot in raw. But wait, you have to do some work then. A little bit of work, and it's also a much larger file. If you're shooting in a JPEG format, you can take way more photos than you could through raw on the same size memory card. The benefit, you can take more pictures, you can bring your pictures into a kiosk in a Walmart or a Henry's or any store that you choose, put your little memory card in that device and print your photos right there on the spot. With RAW, because it's uncompressed, because it has its own language per se, called a codec, you actually have to use very proprietary software to edit that RAW image. Now there are some softwares like Photoshop and others that are compatible with all types of RAW. But your camera will come with the appropriate software to do it automatically. One of the hallmarks of a digital single lens reflex over many of the other cameras that we're going to encounter is that it can do RAW. And because it can do RAW, the camera manufacturers are going to include the software as part of the package that effectively allows you to do that cooking, to make that photograph available for use in these kiosks for printing, for distribution through email, and for posting on web sharing sites or sending to family and friends. The illusion that we can only shoot JPEG because it's simpler, it's just not founded anymore. So we're going to encourage you, both through the photo contest that we're going to be running and through your own exercises, where you can shoot raw. It's like getting the meat or the eggs or the vegetables in a way that allows you to cook them to suit yourself. Not the way some arbitrary committee chose to shoot them for you. The Joint Photographic Experts Group. Whatever. That's that right. That means. Exactly. <laughs> now, another thing, if you have questions about anything that we're <coughs> talking about, please send them to us. We have our email. It's called questions at dtptv.com, daytripperphototelevision.com. And uh, you can send any question you want to us, and we will reply very, very quickly. 
We don't expect that we'll be able to cover everything in every episode, so the idea of the questions is a good one. We promise that we'll reply and we'll make those answers available on the website. We're also going to be using the website as a repository for photographs that you choose to send in that we're going to talk about at the end of today's episode. That's right. And one thing that you have to remember, though, is when you're sending images over the internet, you don't want to send raw. You want to open that raw image, edit your file, save it as a JPEG, and send us the JPEG image of that. And we're going to give you full instructions on how to do that. Now, when we come back, we're going to talk about the most important thing in making a great photo. Welcome back. We're here talking about photography with Day Tripper Television. I'm Brian, this is Ross. Um, one of the things we're going to talk about right now is focusing. And Ross and I both agree, and I'm sure a lot of people also agree, Focus is the most important thing in photography. If you don't have good focus in your photo, if you're not identifying your focal point, which is that one thing in your story, that's in your photograph that's telling the entire story, then you're really not creating a proper photograph. Uh, it's, it's confusing a lot of times if you don't have focus where you want it. So what we're going to talk about today is how to focus, how to choose where you're focusing, and the best places to use these tips. So if I'm going to take a photograph of you, how do I decide what's going to be in focus? Brian used the phrase focal point. What do you mean by that? Well, your focal point is that one item in, one item in your photograph that really tells the story. If you have a, a picture of a field with, a, with an owl in the middle of your field, it's a field with a speck. You don't really notice what the photograph is supposed to be. So if you focus on the owl and you let that really be that one tell of your photo, it's a, it's a totally different image than just a field with an owl in it. So if, for example, I were to take a photograph of Brian from right here, what am I going to focus on? Well, first I'm going to focus on his face, and that's where most of us stop thinking. It's not enough. Part of making a great photo is deciding what that key focal point is. So in the example of a human being, what do you think the focal point should be? When you take a picture of a person, or when you think about photographs that you really loved of people, what was the first thing that your eye was drawn to? I bet it was drawn to the eye. It's absolutely true. The eye is usually, if you're doing portraiture, you want to get the eye in focus. That is the, what is that, the window to your soul, I guess most people say. Now, later on in our show, we have an interview with Navi Noom, who is a fashion and portrait photographer. And if we cut to the image that I have on my screen here, you'll actually see how focusing on somebody's eye can tell a completely different story. Obviously, the focus isn't on the back of her head, it's not on her chin, it's on her eye, and that's what we really want to show. So, thank you for that. So when we focus, our cameras today will incorporate, in pretty much every condition, a default setting called autofocus, meaning I'm going to point my camera at Brian. Do you mind if I do that? Go right ahead. So I point a camera at Brian, I heard a little beep because the camera is auto-focused on him, and if I shoot a picture, God, he's handsome. And it Gosh. shows up right there on the back of my camera. How did that work? Well, inside your camera's viewfinder, as you're looking through, you're going to notice these points. Now, every camera has a different number of points you can choose. You can choose clumps of points, you can choose individual points, or you can choose all points. Now, I just happen to have in, in my D700 53 points that I could choose from, whereas a regular camera such as uh, one of these smaller point shoots or most of the Nikon D90 or any of the, the basic Canon Rebels, they have anywhere from 5 to 11 points of focus. You don't need a thousand points for most things. Where I usually shoot is one point, right in the middle. I lock my focus, and as you saw Ross do, lock your focus, change your composition, and then take your photograph. What you're doing is you're locking the camera's focus on that one point, changing your composition without affecting your focus, and when you capture that image, that one point that you've got focus on is telling the story. Exactly. So when we go to make a photograph, and it doesn't matter what the subject is, the thing that is most important to you as the creator is that that key element is in focus, and that's where you focus on. Now, as Brian says, we can move those points around. You find the way that works best for you. 
we both discovered that focusing to the center, locking the focus, and you can do that on every digital single lens reflex camera, and then composing to create the image feel that you'd like works very well. So if you're uncomfortable with where to start, why not try that? Now, when the camera autofocuses, Brian, it's doing something. How is it, what is it doing? It's What's it looking for? That's a good question. And a lot of people don't fully understand what a camera is doing when it's looking for focus. Has anybody ever taken a picture of a white wall and tried to get focus on that? It's impossible. What happens is a camera is looking for contrast. It's looking for edges of things. And if you have a plain white wall or a plain blue sky or something that has no detail, your camera's going to hunt. You're going to hear that zzz, zzz, back and forth. You're not going to get focus lock on anything, and you won't actually be able to take a picture. But if you take that same plain white wall and you take a big Sharpie marker and draw a line across it, the camera will sense that there's an edge, contrast, and it'll actually be able to lock on that for focus. So if you're ever taking a picture in autofocus and you find that the camera's just not finding what it is it's supposed to be focusing on, you can also just make sure that you look at a line, you look at some sort of edge to something, lock on it, and then change your composition and get your image that way. This process, often called contrast detection, or in some modes, what's called phase detection, looking for changes in the phase of the light, is how the camera autofocuses. And for the most part, it's pretty darn accurate, and most of the time, it's going to be faster than you turning the manual focus ring, like I would have had to do on this older fellow. Look through the viewfinder, twist the ring, bring some little dots together, or bring a split image together. Works pretty well, but it takes more time. With our autofocus systems, we can get to the point of focus that much more quickly. But it may not always work. Well, I do a lot of wildlife. And one thing I've noticed when you're taking pictures of birds in a tree, your camera wants to focus on every branch but the bird. And this is a perfect example of where you'd want to then switch to manual focus. A manual focus, as Ross showed you with the older style camera, was what you had to do. Now you have a choice. If your camera's not locking, on the side of every lens, most lenses, there are some that have it all built into the on-screen menu, but at least on the Canon and the Nikon brand, if you look on the side, there's a little switch. It says AF and MF. Autofocus and manual focus. Or in Nikon's case, it says MA and M. MA would be manual automatic, and M would be full manual. So if I'm trying to take a photograph, and I'm holding it up there, and it's not able to track on something, I'll simply flip that little switch over, turn my focus ring and my viewfinder until I have focus where I like it, and then I'll get my photograph that way. And you know, it's a funny thing. We've had this conversation with students, and they go, well, my camera's out of focus. I can't focus it manually. Actually, you can. There is a ring. There's a ring that you can use to focus your digital single lens reflex. Sometimes that ring doesn't move, and this is where turning the switch off is going to make a difference for you. It's going to vary from vendor to vendor. Find out with your camera how you turn off autofocus. Look for the switch and look for the focus ring. Remember, thousands of images on this card. You can experiment, and we encourage you to do so, so you become more comfortable that as you Take your camera in hand, it becomes much more intuitive to you because you practiced. Practice makes perfect, or close Repetition to it. is the mother of skill. Exactly. Now, another thing that you can work on focus with would be how your camera focuses. I mean, what we're talking about right now is more of a two-dimensional thing, side to side. As long as you are in the same distance away from something, you're going to have focus on it equally as you move your camera. But what if something's coming closer or further away from you? Well, that's a real problem when you're photographing action. It could be wildlife. Brian and I both photograph wildlife. But what if your kids are playing hockey? You want to take photographs of the hockey game and the players are skating to and towards you and away from you. Maybe you're into auto racing. Maybe it's bicycling. There's nothing that prevents you from leveraging the power of autofocus in these fast-moving situations. Absolutely. There's features in your camera that allow you to choose whether you're doing continuous focus or whether you're doing single point focus or anything like that. On the Nikon, it's right here on the side. There's a C, S, and M. M is for manual, S is for single, and C is for continuous. Now, what continuous means is if you start moving towards me, the camera is shifting its focus as you move. So it's continually adjusting for that. So as an example, if you look at the screen here, in one second, here we are. This example here is an owl in flight. Now, as the owl is coming closer to me, 
either I can continue to re-tap and tap and tap and tap or try and manually focus, which is also very difficult, or I can flip it into continuous focus, and as the owl comes towards me, it's continually changing the focus on the camera so I don't have to do any work. Well, and I can verify that that's true in this particular case because I was lying on the ground, and when that owl is coming at you, he's coming at you at about three inches above the ground, right at your head. So any thought you might have had about being very calm and manually <laughs> focusing, that's over. Owls are pretty scary sometimes. They're pretty scary. <laughs> very cool, but pretty scary. Very cool. Brian showed you on the back of the Nikon that it's a switch. In Canon cameras and other vendors, it may be driven through a menu system on the top or on the back. But all of our major digital single lens reflex cameras are going to allow us to choose single point of focus or continuous focus. Different terminology for the same effect. Well, that's pretty much our rundown on focus for the day. Now, we could get a lot more into it. We can bring up graphics and we can bring up displays and so on to help you really get it. But since we're going to be covering things so much more detail as we go, I think that's a good place to start for today. Excellent. So when we come back, we're going to introduce you to a local professional. A professional photographer here in York Region, her name is Navi Noom. And Navi is a reputed fashion and wedding photographer. She also does portraiture, but she's best known for her fashion and wedding work. When we come back, we're going to see an interview with Navi that Brian's conducted, and she's going to share some thoughts on that practice. <laughs> And we're back. So what we want to do is share with you information that's been shared with us by our good friend, professional photographer, Navi Noom. Brian went on location with Navi. We've got some great images of Navi working, and they've got a, had a wonderful conversation that we think you're going to find very interesting. So our wonderful producers are going to cut to that video, and we'll talk to you again very soon. Today we're talking with Navi Noon from Navi Noon Photography. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Um, we're going to talk about a few things that uh, give the viewer some insight into what you do day to day as a working professional. So w when you're trying to get your name out there, um, obviously it's a world full of everybody trying to be mm -hmm. a professional. What do you find works? I would say Facebook is a really great tool. Um, it's a great way to get your name and your work um, to everyone beyond you know, your circle of friends because you know, there's friends of friends and uh, let's you promote yourself and it's free. That's the best part, right? So you're, it's always nice to be able to kind of cut corners when it comes to you know, expenses and that kind of stuff. So uh, Facebook is great. Twitter. Um, the thing is, though, with when you're posting a link or a photo, uh, the lifespan of it's a lot shorter on Twitter. You know, it's like feed, crazy feed. So sure. Facebook is good because once somebody sees it and they like it, they share it, they comment it. Again, their friends see it and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So uh, Facebook. I also have a blog. So uh, the website is, you know, best of the best. Blog is kind of, you know, everyday stuff. I want to post that, keep it a little more personal. So it's good that people just not know you, know, you as a photographer, but who you are. So you put your master work on your website yeah. and you put your updates and all your statuses. And yeah, to keep people, you know, in, uh, engaged and to kind of be able to follow you, see what you're up to and new projects, uh, interesting things. It might not always be, you know, what you've shot. It could be something that you're interested in that maybe you think your readers might want to look into as well or read about. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I've seen your work and I think it's brilliant. Nice. Um, and I can tell from looking at your stuff a, a distinct style. How would you describe this style? I think that's a tough question. I, I actually really don't like that question. <laughs> I'm joking. Um, <laughs> just because I, it's, I find it hard to really describe because the best way I can put it is I'm a huge fan of Andy Leibovitz. Um, I'm not a big, you know, name dropper for photographers. I just recognize work, but she's the one person that I, I'm, I follow a lot and I really like your work. So the best way I can describe my style is um, I'm more of a, a Vanity Fair shooter than a Vogue. Like Vogue is very elaborate, you know, huge production, very um, couture fashion. Vanity Fair is still, you still have a little bit of fashion styling in it, but it's a little more 
real, I guess, is the best way to put Based it. Based in reality. Yeah, so you can, I mean, you look at her work and she has just a simple portrait and it's still fantastic because of the lighting and style. And the emotion. Just yeah, like it's the, the story behind it, right? right so right. I would say that I liked, you know, to have a story behind the photo. Trying to, str like, stray away from the typical serious pose. You know, I want a little bit of edge there, a little, a little more story behind the, the, the picture in the face. Well, I that's excellent, and, and thank you very much for coming on our thank show. Thank you for having me. Um, hopefully you'll be coming on our show again. I would love to. Excellent, thank you. Now, how could people out there get a hold of you and, and you know, hire you for their... Um, they can visit my website at www.navinoom.com. I believe it should be at the bottom Somewhere of the screen there. Uh, or my blog, uh, which is blog.navinoom.com, Facebook. Uh, my name's pretty unique I guess you can say so it's pretty easy to find me if you just google Navi Noom so <laughs> well that's excellent thank you very much thank you thanks take care having me and we're <laughs> back that's pretty cool Brian Navi shared a uh, I think a lot of good information what are the key things that you took out of that conversation you had with it you'd want to share with the audience it was actually quite a long conversation we had. Some of the things that she didn't talk about are some of the very, some of the things that aren't on the tape are actually some very important things as well. Um, one of the things that she did mention was that you, you want to get your name out there appropriately. If you're trying to get into being a wedding photographer or any kind of uh, professional photographer, you have to get your name out there to the people that can use you. So the way Navi always did that was with her Facebook and her Twitter and, and you know, social media. Uh, social media is actually quite large. You'll also see that in future interviews. Um, but another thing that she mentioned was you want to have a shot list. You want to have, you want to go into a situation prepared. You want to know what you want to talk about, what kind of photos you want to come home with, and you also want to make sure that you capture those photos while you're on location. Another so you want to have to have, you have to have a plan. That's absolutely the main point, is you want to plan your shoot. You want to make sure your gear is clean, you want to make sure your memory cards are empty, your batteries are charged, and have a plan that you're going in with. The concept of a shot list is not a new one. In fact, any professional photographer that you encounter is going to have a shot list. If you've ever seen, or maybe you've been a professional musician, there's a thing called a set list. Everybody knows what song they're going to play and what order they're going to play them. We do the same thing as photographers. If we're going to go out and we're going to shoot a wedding, for example, uh, better get the bride, the groom, together, bride's mother, bride's father. You can see now that we're building a list. The concept of a shot list helps you because now you don't have to try to remember everything. Absolutely. That's a good one. Absolutely. And that's something that I use even planning for our show. Absolutely. What else you got? Well, some other things that we want to focus on are... Um, Important things as far as professional photographers would be, you know, have the right gear for the right job. You don't want to go into any other shoot with the wrong stuff. If you're going to do a portrait photography shoot and you're bringing equipment that you would use normally for wildlife photography, it may not perform the same way. So you want to make sure you have the appropriate equipment for what you're shooting. But that's a real fear that a lot of photographers getting into, into either the business or just, you know, as a great hobby. There's a fear that they've got to go out and buy all kinds of gear all the time, but they don't really have to. Not really. I mean, it, it depends on what you're shooting. For example, with, with myself, I run Day Tripper Photo. I'm doing all different things. Uh, at the end of the month, I'm doing a portrait session with zombies and, and really pretty models, uh, where next month I'm going to Algonquin Park with moose and other crazy things. So y I wouldn't necessarily bring the same equipment to both, but I'd need both types of equipment. Right, but you're a, pr you're a professional. For many of our audience members, this is not their primary thing. So what they can do is you can rent. There's absolutely nothing wrong with renting gear to find out, is it usable? Is it something I'd use all the time? Before you drop the dime on it. Absolutely. Very good point. Very and, and don't be afraid to try that. What we've discovered is there are a number of sources for rental gear in Canada. Now, Brian works for Henry's. Obviously, they've got a very good rental program, but there's lots of sources. So before you go out spending a lot of money on stuff you're not sure about, why not try it? Before I decided on a particular lens for my camera, I went through a number of test flights, determined that there was enough value to it, and then it also gave me some time to save up the money to buy the lens I really wanted, which was a 14 millimeter ultra wide angle not inexpensive, but by testing it and finding out that it would work for me for the purposes that I needed, that made a lot of sense.
So having the right gear doesn't necessarily mean you have to own everything. There are a lot of resources available to help you try things out. Excellent point. Now one other thing I do want to make a point on is where you buy your equipment. Now obviously I work for Henry's and it's not just that I work for Henry's that I would mention this, but there's a lot of customers that come into the store that say, you know, I'm trying to buy a camera, what do I do, where do I go? Believe it or not, there's a lot more involved in choosing the right gear for you than just walking into a store and taking it home. So going to a store that has the ability to educate you and walk you through your, your options and make sure that you're choosing the right option for you is actually very, very important. Not only that, but follow-up service. Using a camera obviously can be very confusing. So when you buy it from a store that has knowledgeable staff that can actually walk you through exactly what it is you'd like to know, you will get better results in the long run. There's no doubt about that. Think about anything other investment that you've made. You like ha to have a good life cycle experience. But if you found yourself, you've got some kit, you're not completely familiar with it, there are lots of resources. And hi, welcome to Day Trooper Television. We're one of those resources to help you make better photos. <coughs> now, when we come back, we're going to tie up what we did in today's episode and tell you about an extremely exciting opportunity for you to win new gear. And that is commercial. Okay, and we're back. Pick it up. Well, thank you for coming back. Um, I hope you're enjoying the show so far. We certainly are. And what we're going to do right now is we're going to go over just to clarify what you've learned and how to apply what you've learned from today's episode. One of the things that I want to mention would be, you know, what makes cameras different? Sensor size, lens ability, manual control ability as well. These are all very, very important things. So Brian, can you hand me that little tiny sensor th oh, example sure that you had? Thing. And if I can trouble you to take the lens off your lovely D700 I'd be there. happy to. And in fact, I will pop that open. <coughs> so one of the first things that we talked about was the advantage of the digital single lens reflex. Here's the question for you. Do you want to be making those killer images of your family and friends with a sensor that's this size or, or something that's perhaps a bit larger? The bigger sensor is going to give you a better image. That's why the digital single lens reflex is such a good choice. Once we've got that digital single lens reflex available to us, how do we ensure that we're going to get a photo that is compelling not just to us as photographers, but to other people who look at it? What are we looking for? Detail, quality, focus. Focus. It's very important to have good focus. Absolutely. So. The second major point that we covered is the importance of finding focus, finding the focal point that's important to you in your image, and then taking the time to make sure that you've got focus. There have been literally thousands of images that have been taken that have become worldwide, worldwide respected as great photos that by all the technical terms aren't great photos, but they tell a compelling story and they do so by being sharp and in focus. So that was the second thing we talked about. Then we looked at the different ways you can store your image. JPEG versus RAW. And RAW rules. RAW wherever you can. JPEG when you need to reduce the number of uh, the size of the image on your memory card. But for the most part, you're always going to get the most flexibility, the most agility when you shoot RAW. Absolutely. It gives you much more you can do with it after the fact. <coughs> we also saw a great video with Navi Noom, who shared with you some thoughts on how to be prepared to bring the right kit and show up with a shot list so it doesn't matter what you're shooting, whether it's your child's hockey game, your sister's wedding, you're prepared to get the images that you wanted to get out of it so you're happy and that the folks who look at your photographs are happy. To help you apply many of the things that we talked about today, we've decided to have every episode a photo challenge. And Brian, you put together a challenge for the first episode. What is it? Well, the challenge for the first episode is something that's actually <coughs> very near and dear to me. Someone you love. It's as simple as that. Since we've talked about focus, since we've talked about the basics of your camera, we're going to keep it very straightforward. Nothing too demanding, but at the same time, it leaves you a wide open surface for interpretation. You can really 
makes someone you love something completely different than what we're thinking about, and it would mean just as much to the end result. Remember, the photograph is your photograph. You choose the subject, you choose the orientation, you choose the layout, you choose the exposure, you choose the composition. Whether you go fully automatic, or whether you go fully manual, or somewhere in between, you get to decide. It's your photograph. The idea, though, is that we've got a theme. The theme is somebody you love. You choose to make the photograph that you'd like. And it's going to be really, really simple. You make the photograph, you do whatever it is that you want to do to it, and then, as you'll see in our episode, we've got an email address for you to send a JPEG photo to. It's really easy to remember, too. It's photocontest at dtptv.com. And that'll be available to you in the credits, and you'll be able to see that. And it'll also be on our website with a hot link, so it's easy for you to mail your photos in. Now, the nice thing about the idea of an assignment is it gives you a prescription for an outcome, but it doesn't tell you how to make it. You apply your skill, your talent, and your desire to make it an image that's going to be lasting for you. By the way, when we talk about images, we're also the co-founders of the New Market Camera Club, and one of the first rules that we decided on when we created this club is that there's no going to be no hostile criticism. So feel free and feel comfortable. Any photographs that you send in are never going to be critiqued. They're never going to be ridiculed. We're going to find the best elements of everything. And we've got a whole bunch of folks who are now members of that club. It's been incredibly successful. And I think people keep coming out because they like that. That's right. And one of the things we do at the beginning of every club is we have a photo review. And like, our, like Ross said, our photo review is not demeaning in any way. Basically, what we're looking at are the technical merits of your photograph. Did you, get the cap or did you capture the image that you were hoping for? How many shots did you take to get that one photo? And we talk about exposure techniques and all these different settings as well to help you understand how to reproduce that image yourself. Now, for the photo contest, there's a, there is a prize. And Brian's going to tell you more about that. But there's always guidelines for any type of contest. So we've assembled a panel of independent judges who are going to look at the photographs and we're going to have a different theme for each episode. So you'll have lots of opportunities to enter. It's not just down to one. But we're going to look at some key things. Does the photo convey the theme that was assigned? And hopefully the photo does that without having or, or requiring, pardon me, an explanation. Is the photograph exposed appropriately? Note I didn't say correctly, because exposure is a subjective choice. Our cameras will do so automatically, but you might choose to modify that, and that's okay. Does the exposure help convey the theme of the image? We're also going to look at what's called composition. Now, I promise you we're going to have an entire segment of one of our episodes focused on composition. Not rules. Tips. Guidelines. The idea, though, in any good composition is that it supports the theme. It supports the goal of the photograph that you're making. So our judges are going to look at, is the theme conveyed? Is the exposure appropriate to the theme? Is the composition pleasing to the eye? And is it in focus? That's a big one. So those are the kind of the criteria that we're going to be looking at that our panel of judges is going to be looking at and helping us define the contest winners. Brian, what's the contest? Well, you see, this is where it's going to get fun. First of all, for full rules and explanation of what the contest is involving, please go to dtptv.com, and that'll give you all the information you need. And the prizes, that's, that's the fun stuff. We got to thank a few people for this. We really put our, our feelers out there and got some great stuff. First of all, we have camera bags from Lowepro. Lifetime guaranteed camera bags are fantastic. We've got things like memory cards and filters, and uh, we actually have Sigma giving us a lens, an 18 to 250 millimeter lens. Pretty much an entire camera package is going to be given away with extra prizes, additional camera bags and so on for runners up and um, 
honorable mentions and so on. Now again, we're not going to sit here and say that your pictures are bad or the pictures are whatever. We're going to look at them on the technical merit. So everybody has a chance to win. And these prizes are fantastic. So I do want to thank a few people. I want to thank the, the company Gentech and Ron Anderson in particular for donating so many products for our show on, our air, on air and for our contest. Things like Sigma, SanDisk, Velbon tripods, which are also included in the prize package. And I also want to thank uh, Damon uh, Distribution and specifically Paul Matter for giving us products like Lowepro and LensBaby and Sekonic and even Nissan Flash that we're going to be using on our show as well. Most of the gear that we're going to use as we demonstrate episodes, and in fact in our gear episode, because I promise you we're going to have one, is either kit that Brian and I have gone into debt to acquire, <laughs> or that's, that's been donated for the purpose of demonstration by our sponsors. We want to thank them very much, because it helps us build what we hope is a better program for you. In our next episode, we're going to look at something that's critical to great photographic success, and that's exposure. We look forward to seeing you again soon. For Day Tripper Television, I've been Ross Chevalier. And I'm still Brian Weiss. See you again soon. Peace. Well, I guess we'll find out how we did.